أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ويسألونك عن ذي القرنين قل سأتلو عليكم منه الذكرى إنا مكنا له في الأرض وآتيناه من كل شيء سببا آية نمبر 83 و 84 في سورة الكهف ويسألونك عن ذي القرنين and they ask you about Zulkarnain, Kul Sa'atlu, say I'm going to tell you, Alaykum Minhu Zikra, something by which he ought to be remembered. So Allah Ta'ala says that in the Quran he's going to tell us the important and relevant parts of the story of Zulkarnain. So what are the relevant parts? Inna makkanna lahu fil ardi wa aatainahu min kulli shayin sababa. So the first thing is, Inna makkanna lahu. Allah Ta'ala established him securely. So inna means behold. Behold, pay attention. That Allah established him securely fil ardi on earth. وَآتَيْنَاهُ مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ سَبَبًا And endowed him with the knowledge of the right means to achieve anything. Now there are two things here to focus on. The first one, where has he been established? And the second one, what has he been given by Allah? So the first thing is that Allah has established him on earth. And I want you to focus on this. Inna makkanna lahu fil ard. Behold, we established him securely on earth. Now pay attention please. Ard and earth. What I want to point out here is two things. Number one, in the olden history and science before Islam and even many many centuries after Islam, the planet earth we live on was considered to be the center of the universe, maybe 90% of the universe. And it was thought that everything in existence is Earth, the land we are on. So it was more like the universe. And on top of it is a sky, which has got some small stars in it, which are just like small lights, nothing big. And above that sky is God. Below this Earth is hell. Above the sky is heaven. End of story. Quran for the first time established that this land we live on is actually one whole small entity known as Al Ard. And the English word earth actually comes from earth. And many of the English words and many of the scientific terminologies and even terminologies of common use in English language are directly from the Quran. Now, Quran is the first book written in Arabic. So the mention of this planet as Ard or Earth is very first time in the Quran. And Quran gives the concept that this is just one planet, Al Ard. And above it is a big sky with many, many stars, Kawakib, Najum, the sun is there. And then beyond it is another universe, the second heaven. And beyond that is another universe, the third heaven. And then the fourth heaven, and the fifth heaven, and the sixth heaven, and the seventh heaven. And they're immense. They are massive. They are big. What you see is just one whole entity. Not the whole universe. A whole entity known as earth. And the word earth is literally translation of earth. Another important uh, thing is that, you know, nowadays we sit on the sofas. The concept of making a sofa comes from the Quran. When Allah Ta'ala describes the people in Jannah, in heaven, in paradise, they are sitting on something known as masfufa, or namarek or masfufa. And these are like elevated places on which they sit, not like on the floor, not on a cushion, but a bit elevated than the floor and the cushion. And they have a view of everything around. So people tried to envision that and they came up with the concept of sofa. So the, even the sofas, which is a very common item of use, is inspired by the Qur'an and the name comes directly from the Qur'an. Going back to this ayah, Allah has established him on the earth, the whole earth. So Zulkarnain is no ordinary king. 
he has been given power and he has been consolidated with that power and established securely on earth. He can venture into the earth everywhere and do whatever he likes. Allah Ta'ala has endowed him with that knowledge and power. And the rest of the ayah explains that. وَآتَيْنَاهُ مِن كُلِّ شَيْءٍ سَبَبًا And Allah Ta'ala has given him the sabab or the right means to achieve anything that he might set out to achieve. Ibn Kathir, one of the great mufassireen of the Qur'an, he has explained it as literally a means to achieve anything. And he says that it is a knowledge of the right means for the achievement of a particular end. And not only is Ibn Kathir saying this, but this explanation is also given by Ibn Abbas, by Mujahid, by other scholars like Saad Ibn Jubair, Ikrama, and Qatada, and ad So all the ancient scholars, they're agreed on it, that he had this extraordinary means of achieving whatever he wanted. You can call it a miracle of Allah, or it could be just direct knowledge given to him. Now, in the Quran, it has been mentioned at uh, other places of extraordinary knowledge to do extraordinary feats. Uh, for example, we know the, from the story of Suleiman al-Islam that uh, when he wanted the throne of the Queen of Sheba, Balqis, to be brought to him before she reaches, uh, one of the members of his court who is a minister and a human being he says that he can bring it within a blink of an eye now that is an extraordinary means of achieving something and again Allah Ta'ala had given him knowledge it wasn't by magic that he brought it he had the knowledge interestingly this concept described in the Quran for hundreds of years remained unexplored especially by the Muslims we did not look much into it and it's very clearly stated in the Quran. It wasn't magic. It was a knowledge which did it. Till in the last 100 years or so, people started looking into it from the West and they developed the concept of teleportation. And this teleportation, initially it was hypothetical and it was all fiction. You could have uh, come across this in stories. If people uh, who come from uh, the last century, my generation, and were brought up in the 80s. If they could recall, there was something called a Star Trek, and they had a special machine, and they were beaming people from one place to another, and they had this very famous uh, dialogue, Beam Me Scotty. So there was a machine, and they would transport a person from one point to another without traversing the physical space between them. So you would disappear from one place and appear in another. This teleportation, is exactly what the Quran describes, how the throne of Queen Bilqis from Yemen was brought to Palestine, to Jerusalem, uh, to Suleiman al-Islam before she even arrived. And research nowadays has managed to do this kind of teleportation at atomic level. They call it quantum teleportation. And there are some Australian scientists who have even managed to do it by teleporting matter waves and laser beams they make them disappear at one location and reappear at another. So they're getting closer and closer to this concept which Allah Ta'ala has described in the Quran and which happened thousands of years ago at the time of Sulaiman al-Islam. So coming back to Zul Karnan, you will see that he has these extraordinary means to travel too. I'm not suggesting he could teleport just like the minister in Sulaiman al-Islam's court or maybe he could, we don't know. But Allah is keeping it open for us to do research and to look into he is stimulating our mind, he's stimulating our thought and say, look, I've given him extraordinary means to travel and achieve whatever he wanted to. Here is something for you to look into and find out how you could also gain that knowledge. Now the next ayah, ayah number 85, is very short, just two words. Fattaba'a sababa. So he followed one of those extraordinary means given to him by Allah. Now, why is such a short ayah, just two words? Fattaba, hence, and then he followed Sababa, one of those means, to emphasize that this is an extraordinary knowledge and feat that is going to be accomplished. Allah Ta'ala has given him this special understanding and special capability and is using it. So it's such a big thing. 
that he is using the special means that Allah has dedicated a whole ayah and emphasized it with just two words, Fattaba Sababa. And then he followed those means. And guess what happened? Hatta iza balaga maghrib ash-shamsi wajadaha taghrubu fi aynin hamiyatin wa wajada indaha qawman. So he followed these means till when he came to the setting of the sun. It appeared to him that it was setting in a dark, turbid sea, and nearby he found a nation. So he follows these means and he reaches the far, far end of the known world in the west, where he sees that the sun is setting in a spring of black, muddy water or sea. Interestingly, it doesn't say in the Quran that he sees the sun setting in the water. It says that it appeared to him that the sun is setting in the water. And although all the translations mention it as a dark, turbid sea, the word used here is not bare. And we know we've talked about it before that uh, Allah Ta'ala talks about Majma al-Bahrain, where the two seas are meeting, and the word Bahr is used in Surah Kaf just a few ayahs before. But here Allah uses the word Ayn, and Ayn is actually a body of water, abundant body of water. But there is a difference between Ayn and Bahr. Bahr, as we talked about earlier, is a big body of water, could even be a big river, could be a big lake, could be a sea, where the second end cannot be seen. So you cannot see the other end of that body of water. And that was the general concept in the ancient world, that when you reach to the end of the known land mass, you come across endless water. It's just water going on and on and on, and there is no land. But when Allah Ta'ala uses the word Ain, He is saying that even at the very end of of the land in the west, the farthest west that you can go. When he reached there, he found an abundant body of water which had land on the other end. So what Allah is saying is, no matter how far you go, no matter how much you travel, every body of water has land on the other end. And that is because the earth is round. Now, Hold that thought for a bit. And let's see, what did the Muslims think of it? What did the scholars think of it? So, Ibn Kasir, again, a big Mufassir, and Imam Razi, who's also a very big Mufassir of Quran, they say that the sun appeared to be setting in a dark, turbid sea to Zulkarnain because it was an optical illusion of the sun disappearing into the sea. It wasn't really disappearing in the sea. It was an optical illusion. And Imam Razi explains it. He says, well, he looked at it and looked like it was disappearing into the sea because the earth is spherical. And it's amazing. Imam Razi himself was a scientist. He was a big scientist. But he says that this was known even to the earlier scholars of Islam. So, Abu Ali al-Jubai, who is a very famous Mutazili scholar and who died in 303 Hijra, which is about 916 AD, he had said the same thing. He said the optical illusion of the sun setting in the water at the very end of the sea is because the earth is spherical. It's just an illusion. If you go across that water, you find more land and then you see the sun setting there too and you follow it more and you see the sun setting there too. So Quran is saying the same, that it appeared to Zulkarnan that the sun was setting in the water. And early scholars very clearly concluded from it that the earth is spherical and no matter how much you travel, every body of water would be followed by land again because you're coming to the same land if you go very far. And it would be just appearing to be setting there, but not in reality setting in water as the water edge is not the end of the planet earth. At this point, it makes me wonder, why did these early scholars like uh, Ar-Razi and Ibn Kathir and Abu Ali al-Jubai, why did these people 
have so much knowledge of science along with religion and have looked into it and have come to know that in the ancient times among the muslims there was no demarcation between the religious knowledge and the scientific knowledge they went hand in hand for example you've heard of jabir bin hayyan famous chemist he made uh, sulfuric acid he made glass beakers he studied the reaction of glass with materials and found out that glass is the most inert of all substances so if you want to do any chemical experiments do them in glass beakers because glass does not react to them and your experiments are pure and they don't get adulterated by the material like if you use a iron pot or a copper pot they can react so he laid the foundations of chemistry he was the father of modern chemistry yet jabir bin hayyan was a very big religious scholar and his teacher who taught him religion who taught him science chemistry and mathematics was none other than the great imam jafar sadiq and another scholar of imam jafar sadiq is imam abu hanifa now people don't realize that imam jafar sadiq was also a renowned chemist he was a renowned scientist a renowned physician and a renowned scholar and imam abu hanifa which we all uh, relate to as a big scholar of islam was himself a big scientist a big chemist a big physician but because his religious work superseded his scientific work so he known he came to be known as a scholar of islam jabir bin hayyan's scientific work superseded his religious work so he became to be known as a scientist but in early islam there was no demarcation and i think this is where we have failed we have differentiated between the religious knowledge and the scientific knowledge and we've gone astray we have neither achieved one nor the other and you compare the tafsir of the ancient ulama of ibn kathir and of ibn abbas and imam al razi and uh, ad dahak and even the mutazili shia scholar uh, abu ali al jubai and you see they have a very scientific approach and when you come to the tafsir of the modern scholars they are omitting all those important scientific facts which over hundreds of years have been recorded in islamic history so you come to a modern tafsir and it is so deficient that it gives an opportunity to the non muslims to object to it and say look quran is saying that the sun sets in water quran is saying that at the west end of the world there is just water a murky water and the sun is setting there yet you go back more than a thousand years and the tafsir are telling you the world is round the earth planet is round quran itself is saying that earth is an entity by itself and at the end of the western landmass there is no unlimited sea there is an ayn hamia thing which is a dark body of water which has land on the other end of it too and this all has been ignored due to our ignorance and nothing else coming back to the story what zulkarnain finds is not just a body of water and uh, see that the sun is setting there he also finds a nation there wa wajada indaha qauman and allah taala says to him kulna ya zulkarnain imma an tuazzib wa imma an tattakhidha fihim husna Allah Ta'ala says, we said, O Zulkarnain, it's up to you either cause them to suffer or treat them with kindness. Here Allah Ta'ala is mentioning two things. Firstly, we come back to the same point, that destiny or qadr is not one way road, it's not a one way lane. Allah Ta'ala gives you options. So here Allah is showing that that he gave two types of destinies in the hands of zulkarnain for these people either you can punish them or you can be kind to them and forgive them so apparently these people are not the best of the nations on the planet so there are some troublemakers and most of them of three has agreed upon it that these people were troublemakers so allah taala says to zulkarnain you can either punish them or you can be kind to them but this option is also a test remember 
according to the hadith, Prophet, uh, Prophet Suleiman he was given an option by Allah Ta'ala. He sent to him the angel and angel said to him, Allah Ta'ala gives you an option to choose from three things. You can either have money or you can have power or you can have knowledge. So here Allah is giving three takdeers to Suleiman Choose from three takdeers, money, power or knowledge. And what does Suleiman Islam choose? He says, I choose knowledge. And Jibreel says that Allah has given you power and money with it. And he says, why? He said, because power and money, they follow knowledge. So Suleiman al-Islam chose from the three takdeer Allah has given him one. And that one takdeer was the right choice. And he got the other two takdeers with it for free. Similarly, when the Prophet ﷺ went to Taif and the people of the Taif mistreated him, uh, Allah Ta'ala sent the angels to him and gave him an option. If you want, I can use these two mountains around Taif to crush these people. But what did the Prophet ﷺ choose? No, he chose forgiveness for those people. So this is also a test. It's like a multiple choice question. You get options. And here Allah Ta'ala is giving two options to Zulkarnain. He says, either you can punish them or you can be kind to them and forgive them. And inshallah, tomorrow we will talk about it, how Zulkanan makes the choice and what choice does he make and what implication does that choice have for us in this day and age. May Allah give us the knowledge and the wisdom to truly understand his message in the Quran. Ameen, summa ameen. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Please remember everyone in your prayers. Jazakallah khair.